Next up, we have uh, Dr. Nicholas Thiessen. He's a faculty trauma surgeon at Chandler Regional Medical Center. Uh, he's also the director of trauma ICU. So I'm going to be talking about intravenous fluid resuscitation in trauma patients. Uh, don't go chasing waterfalls. As I was preparing for this lecture, I was watching the movie The Other Guys. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's a movie with Will Ferrell and uh, Mark Wahlberg. And the, one of the main characters in there keeps referencing TLC quotes. So I thought it was kind of funny as I was preparing this. I have no financial disclosures, unfortunately. And just to remind people, this is a quick fire. So I'm going to be talking about a very controversial topic. Um, I'm going to be highlighting three major articles, uh, but it is a controversial topic. We only have 15 minutes. I'm just going to try to hit the highlights of uh, the overall uh, topic. Really, I'm going to talk about the history of fluid resuscitation, crystalloids. We're talking about three major topics uh, and data that supports what we're going to be talking about, and then something called the assessment of blood consumption score. So we talk about shock. It was first described by a French surgeon in the 1800s uh, taking care of gunshot victims. And he said it was basically like a jolt to the physiological system or a shock. In 1819, it was the first recorded description of a, a human to human blood transfusion. And subsequently, people have won the Nobel Prize looking at blood types and all sorts of different aspects of blood transfusion. And even before that, in the 1600s, people used to do blood transfusion with animals. And they would take mentally ill patients and transfuse them with just a little bit of sheep's blood, thinking that the calming qualities of the sheep uh, would provide some benefits to those patients. Uh, they didn't have any uh, reactions because they were only receiving a small quantity of blood. When we talk about resuscitation, I think sometimes we forget what that term um, actually means. So if you Google, pull out your smartphone, and just type in resuscitation, the actual definition is the process of correcting an underlying physiological problem in an acutely ill patient, right? And so we think about CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. What do we do, right? We jump on the chest, and we try to, you know, compress the heart, and we bag them or intubate them, try to prevent some or try to provide some uh, oxygenation or ventilation to that patient. What about in trauma patients? When we're resuscitating a trauma patient, what is the underlying physiological problem? You know, for us, it's really bleeding is what we're looking at. Can we correct or, or resuscitate or correct the underlying physiological problem? So three major papers that we're gonna talk about in this talk is the PROMET, the PROPER, and the PAMPER trials, and we'll get into those in just a second. We've already seen this before. Why are we here at STAX? It's the trauma is the leading cause of death, and people from 1 to 44, if you're out in the res, it's 1 to 55 or higher. Trauma is the third leading cause of death in the United States. And if you look at the last decade, there's actually been more deaths from injury, up 23%. And I couldn't find the exact reason why, but I was wondering if it was from selfies, like at the Grand Canyon or other locations. Now, 20 to 40% of patients uh, that die in your hospital from trauma is, is involved in some massive hemorrhage. So they've already been admitted and they die, 20 to 40 percent is because they bled to death. So can we fix that? So this is a uh, paper from the, uh, the, general, or the Journal of Emergency Medicine uh, last year, and they looked at the association of pre-hospital IV fluids in penetrating trauma patients. They found no difference in patients that received fluid or didn't receive fluid. There are some problems with this because uh, the transport time was like 10 minutes and nine minutes between the two groups. So they got to the hospital pretty quick. But something that sticks in my mind is we had a resident uh, in our ICU and they were watching a patient get resuscitated with IV fluid, but they were bleeding to death. And he yelled out, if you bleed, you lose blood, All right? And it kind of stuck with me, right? If you bleed, you lose blood, why are we giving IV fluids, right? Shouldn't we be giving blood products to this patient? So people have looked at this in the literature from pre-hospital care, hypertonic fluids, crystalloid, LR, normal saline, plasma light. Uh, but if someone's bleeding, shouldn't they be receiving blood, right? And that's what the military did. And coming up, I'll show you some papers. You know, if you bleed, you should be getting blood. 
So Dr. Holcomb and the military guys that looked at giving whole blood, hemostatic adjuncts, so giving PCC, FIBA, Kcentra, uh, TXA, doing viscoelastic testing, T, uh, which is like TAG or Rotem or point of care testing right away. In adjunct to all of this, they talked about damage control resuscitation, all right? So if you think about, I think everyone in this room probably took ATLS. The eighth edition, they talked about aggressive fluid resuscitation, slam in two liters of fluid. The ninth edition came out, they revised that. They said, no, instead of doing an aggressive resuscitation, we'll do more balanced resuscitation and give one liter of fluid. And now there's a 10th edition out, right? And it's in my inbox, I need to look at it and kind of go over it. But what the military did was they coined this term damage control resuscitation. We take the, the idea of, sorry, you take this idea of a balanced resuscitation with permissive hypotension, limiting your crystalloids, and then starting a massive transfusion protocol. So the military and their observations said, you know what, our patients do better, the, the soldiers do better with uh, this whole blood and this balanced resuscitation. Well, let's look at that. So Dr. Holcomb uh, published his paper in uh, JAMA in 2013. It was an observational study, and they basically looked at patients receiving blood products at trauma centers and who survived and who did better. I'm not going to get into like the nitty-gritty of the methods. Again, this is kind of a quick fire. But what they did is they looked at the ratio of plasma to red blood cells and platelets to red blood cells. And those with an unbalanced resuscitation, meaning those receiving more PRBCs, to platelets or more PRBCs to plasma actually had a three to four times more likely risk of dying, okay? Now, one of the problems with this paper is that it was just an observational study. So there was this thing called survival bias or reverse causation. So was it that your treatment caused patients to survive longer or, and another way to think about it, the patients that received treatment were gonna survive anyway but they, received, they survived long enough to receive a balanced resuscitation, right? So that's kind of the downfall of observational study. So Holcomb, two years later in JAMA 2015, said, okay, well, that was an observational study. Let's take a randomized controlled trial where we try to do a, a true balanced resuscitation, one to one to one. Let's mimic whole blood, right? If you're losing blood, let's replace that, okay? A one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one versus a one-to-one-to-two. -one -to so one unit of platelets, plasma, to two units of PRBC, or one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, and do a randomized controlled trial. So again, not getting into nitty-gritty of the paper about the methods and all of that, basically what they found was that there was no difference in mortality, overall mortality, right? So multiple or system organ failure, uh, sepsis, uh, those types of things. But what they did find is that those who received a more balanced resuscitation of a one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, were more likely to achieve hemostasis sooner, and they were less likely to die from exsanguination. Now, this spurred a lot of controversy and a lot of central dogma for some trauma centers, uh, but I just came back from Boston at the Merit College of Surgeons, and what uh, Holcomb and a lot of other people are now looking at is this idea of a fixed ratio resuscitation, right, or balanced resuscitation of one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, and then moving into point of care uh, resuscitation, meaning you start off with a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one and then immediately get your TAG or your ROTEM or your viscoelastic testing or your INR or your PTT and then start resuscitating based on that. And that's what the next kind of overall papers are gonna kind of come out and look like. So those are two kind of looking at balanced resuscitation this other paper that just came out in New England Journal of Medicine, I feel obligated to mention it, it just came out and it's kind of a hot topic right now, was what about pre-hospital, right? So what if, so it's great that we have this kind of one-to-one -one resuscitation, but if you look at some of these major trauma centers right, that, that publish this data, especially where uh, Dr. Holcomb's out of, those patients receive thawed FFP in their trauma bay in less than 10 minutes, right? Or they receive platelets in under 30 minutes. So if you think about what your center does, that is fast, right? And some centers can't mimic that. So this paper came out and they looked at what if air transport carried with them thawed plasma and they provided it to patients at risk of bleeding. And so what they found was that mortality at 30 days was actually significantly lower by 10%, 23 versus 33 in the patients that received the thawed plasma. Now there's all sorts of 
kind of uh, limitations with the paper. Uh, one of them was which that the study wasn't blinded. So the hospital crews knew that they were giving plasma right away. So there's questions of did they receive less crystalloid? Did they re go to the hospital faster? Did they all, the, play, the, the uh, air copters that carried the plasma were also more likely to carry packed red blood cells. And so they also received both. So there are some limitations with the paper, but it's interesting concept at least to think about. And I think this article will spur more pre-hospital uh, transfusion kind of data. One of the things I wanted to talk about was the idea of bolusing or challenging someone with IV fluids, right? So uh, that resident, that, that his saying kind of sticks in my mind, uh, you know, if you bleed, you lose blood. Well, if you're bolusing fluid, to me, when you're giving that order, bolus them fluid, you're treating an underlying condition, right? If they're hypotensive, you're saying, I know why they're hypotensive. They don't have enough fluid. I'm going to increase their stroke volume by bolusing them fluid. Well, then is the fluid you're picking the correct fluid, right? If they're dehydrated on meth, they wrecked their car, or jumped off a balcony, then yeah, then maybe they just need a little bit of crystalloid. But if it's because they're bleeding, maybe you should be thinking about a challenge where you give them a little bit of fluid while you're ordering your blood to see if changing the stroke volume actually makes a difference. This uh, article that Holcomb mentioned was this assessment of blood consumption score. There are some centers that are very aggressive to start a massive transfusion right away. How do you know when to start your massive transfusion protocol? So this idea of a uh, ABC score, or the assessment of blood consumption score, is something you can pull up on MedCalc, and they give you these points. So is there a penetrating mechanism of trauma? You get a point. Is there a systolic blood pressure less than 90? You get a point. H, a heart rate greater than 120 or a positive fast. The likelihood of requiring more than 10 units of PRBCs with a score of two is close to like 80 to 90%. And it's, this is kind of a quick calculator that you could put in there. So if you haven't been in a, a trauma center long enough or you just kind of like, hey, I'm just going to start massive transfusion protocol, this kind of gives you a scoring system to help support your decision. And then this idea, keep a, a lookout on, on papers coming out, is the idea of a fixed ratio of resuscitation of one to one to one followed up by uh, a more viscoelastic, meaning TEG or ROTEM or point of care testing. So checking an INR, or PTT, and looking at bleeding times to see is, is your balanced resuscitation working and then what to give next. And that's my talk for today. <laughs>